Um, why don't we kick things off? I'm sure people will start to filter in too, but um, I, you know, it's 3.31 or 5.31 for you guys. I'm still on the West Coast, but um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we are excited to have um, the team from Origin and our wellness community for a event on postpartum recovery in your fourth trimester. Uh, I mean, there are so many things that we know happens to your body between the third and fourth trimester. So really our goal here is just to help you hopefully feel more prepared and start to think about what recovery will look like for you. Um, and I think it's, we have a great like round of perspectives. We've got a physical therapy, a chiropractor and doula. Um, and so we'll have a lot of different, I think, perspectives um, to, to talk through. Um, a quick reminder, we are recording this. So if you have to hop off or um, you know, need to go handle your baby or anything in between. Um, we'll send this all to everyone who RSVP'd after the fact. Um, we also got a lot of questions in advance. So uh, we'll, I'll kind of pop those in, but feel free to leave any questions in the Q and A or the chat box and we'll, we'll cover those. Um, and with that, I will get us started. So um, just to kick it off, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Origin. I'll let um, Lexi share some more about our wellness community, but uh, some background on origin, we are pelvic floor and full body physical therapy for women. So really thinking about kind of all stages of life that you might need this kind of care, whether that's sexual health, pregnancy, postpartum, um, but big believers, I know that Lexi shares this mentality too, which is that women should really have access to this care and it should hopefully be affordable. And so um, that's a big part of our mission is just uh, providing in-network care for this kind of physical therapy, um, which is so crucial in your fourth trimester. Um, and so let's see, oops, did I, I thought I had our, an intro slide, but if not, I'll just do a quick, quick little intro. So um, we have Dr. Lexi, who's the founder and CEO of our wellness community in Dallas. Um, she started this several years ago, really with the goal of, like I said, providing um, access to kind of the affordable holistic healthcare you know, they do a million things that she can talk more about, but really focusing on kind of engagement, empowerment, and just helping women understand um, their bodies. And then on the origin side, we have Dr. Ashley Rollins, who is our lead physical therapist in Texas. Um, she's actually based out of Dallas and specializes in pelvic floor physical therapy around pelvic pain, sexual dysfunction, which we'll touch on, pregnancy related pain and postpartum recovery. So she's got a lot of color to share um, to this discussion. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ashley. Hey, yes. So yeah, first and foremost, let's just, I, we, we wanna have a fun discussion today about all things fourth trimester, pelvic floor, um, healthcare in general, but also just to kind of put a little disclaimer out there, none of this should be, you know, taken as individualized medical advice. We are here to kind of bring awareness and education to the topics that we'll be discussing today. But always, if you have further questions, reach out to your healthcare provider, um, to Lexi, to me individually, and we can um, work on um, helping you and your individual um, needs um, at the time. So let's move on to the agenda. So we're just talking today about all sorts of things pelvic floor, fourth trimester, kind of introduce you to the pelvic floor if it's a newer concept. Um, uh, you know, we all know we have pelvic floors, but what exactly does that do? And we'll kind of talk more about the postpartum body, returning to exercise and sex, uh, touch on a little bit more specifically diastasis, rec re diastasis rectus abdominis or diastasis recti or DRA or mommy tummy, there's so many names for it. And then when to reach out um, for more care. Um, as a real kind of eye-opening statistic to start off with, um, postpartum depression is such, um, can be so pervasive in the fourth trimester. And um, there's a statistic that um, sh shows that doing physical therapy and postpartum care can really reduce your risk of postpartum depression by 50%, which really touches more on the aspect of the pain and dysfunction, the inability to move and exercise can increase your risk of developing postpartum depression. So getting in and getting care, um, creating your healthcare team, um, it takes a village and um, physical therapy, chiropractic care, massage, um, postpartum doula, it's all available for you to help reduce your risk of developing things like postpartum depression. 
So with that said, what is my pelvic floor and what does it do? Touch on it real quick and we'll kind of um, discuss a bit more about how um, it affects some of your functions. Um, I know we have a picture here. I also have a pelvic model. We have our pelvic floor is this group of muscles that um, rest here at the base of our pelvis. They go from our pubic bone to our tailbone, left and right between the two sit bones, and they form this basket or hammock of muscles. I know it's in front of my face. This basket or hammock of muscles that help to hold up our pelvic organs and help to maintain all of the functions of the pelvic floor. Um, so they help to support at the base of the pelvis, they stabilize when they are when they have strength and contraction. They help to stabilize um, our lumbopelvic spine, along with our abdominal muscles, along with our diaphragm, along with our back muscles. Um, they all help to support and stabilize. They also help with continence by closing the pelvic openings at the base of the pelvis. Um, so the vaginal opening, the urethral opening, the the anal opening. And then, um, of course, they help with sexual function. So um, in, in penis owners, this is for erection, um, pleasure orgasm, and vagina owners, uh, uh, you know, um, they can also contribute to pain and dysfunction. And then they, of course, pump blood and lymph flow as part of our circulatory um, muscle pump. So pelvic floor changes and what to do after baby. So much goes on in pregnancy and postpartum. And I'd love to hear your thoughts too, Dr. Lexi. Um, so much can change, as we know, um, to kind of touch on, as the baby grows forward, um, it of course changes our posture. Our body's job is to help maintain balance and you know, stay vertical. When that abdomen grows forward, our body will adapt and um, our center of balance will start to go forward with that. So we make all sorts of adjustments. We don't do them consciously necessarily. Um, you know, our body changes slowly over in pregnancy and over the nine months, and we start to you know do things like um, our, our pelvis will tip forward to kind of help with that those that growing abdomen, and then our back may kind of compensate by increasing your balance backwards. Um, and then you want to see better, so you lean forward a little bit more, and there's ulcers all up and down the spine. <laughs> um, that will really help to contribute to dysfunction. The muscles will get all angry about that. They become overactive because they're trying to help stabilize, um, and it can create a lot of pain and dysfunction. And then, of course, the abdominals pull apart. The connective tissue in the middle of our abdomen, called the linea alba, it stretches and lengthens and thins out over time because of that stretch and those muscles can really um, separate a bit. It's, we'll touch a bit on it a bit more um, in, in a couple of slides, but it is normal in, in pregnancy for that separation to occur and what we wanna try and do is help to kind of protect and stabilize that. What are your thoughts, Dr. Lexi, in some of the changes in pregnancy? The biggest thing that I always like always say, especially in my first visit with pregnant women, is that as our center of gravity changes and we fall, we don't fall forward, right? Because the body is so intelligent and it remains upright. So I'll release usually the piriformis or that butt mm -hmm. muscle prior to um, adjusting the sacrum or the low back simply because it attaches to the sacrum and the hips and allows for a deeper adjustment if it is tight, but it does do a lot of work, right? So it's not the a only lot. muscle that's keeping us upright, but it is one of them that is doing a lot of work during this time. And so I think it's really important to, one, obviously see providers that understand that because it isn't just a sacral adjustment or it isn't just, right. you know, a lumbar adjustment or whatever it may be, right? It, it is full or holistic aspect of it that comes to the body engaging while growing a baby. Yeah. And that piriformis muscle, man, it's tiny but mighty. And <laughs> there's so mm -hmm. much, you know, um, there's nerves, super important nerves that, that go there. Everything is connected and so important to care for throughout your pregnancy. And then in the postpartum period, it all changes. So you spend nine months getting pregnant, and then all of a sudden you are postpartum. And this is when um, the, post, the fourth trimester starts. Kind of more, um, you know, in like, I think the, the way it's defined is the fourth trimester is these first 12 weeks and that after having a baby, I think it's, I think it's a lot more than that. You're, you're postpartum um, forever. And mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we, I, I had seen a question that had kind of come in before that. It, it, you know, when is it when is it or too late or is, how long can we can you know work with our pelvic floor and our abdominals and changes that occur in the postpartum period? It is not. There's no timeline on that. If there's pain and dysfunction in whatever stage of life, this there's always something that can be done to help restore some mobility and improve. Um, improve your pain and, and get you to functioning better throughout your life. But as it relates to those first six weeks postpartum, what happens with the pelvic floor? So, so many changes in those first nine months, so many changes in the nine months, all this increased load on your pelvic floor muscles. There's improve, increased mobility in the pelvic joints and spreading, especially in delivery. Um, and in the first six weeks of the postpartum period, it is normal to experience some amount of urine leakage. You have stress and strain, maybe some bruising and tearing. And sometimes those muscles can, um, and nerves kind of go into this like protect and um, conserve mode, which may lend to some leakage of urine um, and heaviness and swelling in that pelvic area and the vaginal tissues. Um, it's okay to start doing some gentle Kegels at this point. Um, and really this is like, you know, inc increasing awareness and moving them a bit with your breath. Um, not heavy exercise, but getting blood flow back to those tissues, kind of pushing out some of the inflammation and um, really encouraging healing. And of course, gentle movement walking, what, you know, in a pain free manner. After these six weeks, generally we go to our, our obstetric healthcare providers, whether it's an, um, an OB or a midwife, and they can clear you for, for vaginal penetration. In those first six weeks, we are trying to kind of protect any um, wounds not introducing bacteria and allowing for normal stages of wound healing. But after that six weeks, if everything's okay, typically you're cleared for vaginal penetration and exercise. Um, continued leakage at this point though, pain and heaviness, it's not normal anymore. There should be that natural healing process that has occurred in those first six weeks. If you're still experiencing it, then, then it's a time to reach out and, um, and get further health, um, get further care. Of course, if you had a cesarean birth, um, more gentle scar massage at that time, as long as that wound is healed, can be really beneficial um, for healing and preventing scar tissue and wound uh, and adhesion. And then in, in starting to kind of move a bit more um, and doing more exercise. After eight weeks is when we start looking more at that abdominal separation, because like we said, that separation is normal in pregnancy. Um, and then in the postpartum period, it should start to heal on its own. And if not, and we assess for it and it's still there, then that's a point to kind of rehabilitate the muscles. Yeah, I know we've, we've had a question around, um, like if in the postpartum stage you're having, or this fourth trimester, you have like hip and lower back pain. I'd be curious, mm -hmm. either of you, Alexia or Ashley, sort of how you would think about addressing that. Yeah, do you wanna go for it, Dr. Alexi? Sure. Um, for me, obviously, there's a lot of structure changes, right? So mm -hmm. you were open, we have a baby, we close a little bit post baby. So there's a lot happening as you're breastfeeding. And I know that you're going to go over this, Ashley, in a minute. Um, but we're talking about prolactin, but also mm -hmm. relaxin. Relaxin is still there for the amount of time that you're breastfeeding. Maybe not in the same capacity as pregnancy, but it is still there, which creates a lot of weakness, which I think a lot of women, especially in America, will do a lot too, or too much basically in that first yeah. six weeks. Um, a lot of times hip and back pain comes from utilizing the core that they don't have. So <laughs> sweeping, yes. vacuuming, um, cleaning up in any way, picking things up, picking up a toddler, you know, all of these things that really shouldn't happen because if you don't have a front anymore, the back is what gets all of that, right? That's what compensates for that strength that you didn't, that you don't have anymore. And so I think it's really important to realize that um, in the beginning or in the first six weeks, it's really, <laughs> sorry, you guys, um, it's <laughs> really important to rest as much as yeah. possible. Unfortunately, most people don't have that opportunity. Um, but I think a lot of it comes from the gravity pooling too, because we're too upright mm -hmm. in the beginning. And if you think about it, if baby expanded and grew and had all these organs move and we ultimately have all of them come back down and too fast, right? Because if mm -hmm. we're up and we're doing too much and we're doing this and that and cleaning and whatever, that is going to create, and you'll probably touch on this a little bit later too, Ashley, is, is prolapse and things like that because the organs came back too fast. 
And so I think that's something that people need to realize that it is super important to rest that first six weeks. And I know it's a lot to ask. I know it's a lot to people to ask people in America, but I think that's <laughs> what contributes to a lot of low back and hip discomfort um, because we're just not taking it easy enough, you know? Yeah. I totally agree. It's so hard and probably like guilty myself, but it is, it's one of those times where really, truly it's important to rest and heal and, um, and let your body do a lot of the, the healing without interruption and kind of, um, creating a, a, that in that nurturing, nurturing of yourself, that self care that includes rest. Um, it's so hard to do though, because we also see like people like bouncing back, whatever that means. And it, it's right. just like, we get so competitive and it's hard. And I understand um, this postpartum, the fourth trimester is not just about resting, but it's also like, like giving yourself grace and healing and reaching out um, to your community um, to kind of build that support. Um, Cause that baby just does all sorts of stuff. It's not just that you, you, you were pregnant for nine months and then we you lose um, like our muscular strength is, is um, in compromise. But also, you know, the delivery process can be quite traumatic to the pelvis. I mean, the baby's just a little bit crooked and that sacrum is just get stuck in, in some weird positions. And then, not, you know, the ligaments that are then attached to the uterus and the, um, the bladder and everything, they can't, you know, do their normal um, stabilization. And like you kind of touched on, it really is this, this whole connected piece. Um, and it is a time to heal and not stress those, those vulnerabilities. Um, on, the, on the picture here, we have just a couple of different like pelvic floor devices. We talk a bit about pelvic floor function, that mus those muscles are compromised and, and they've been stretched and maybe torn or damaged. Um, some of these um, devices on the, um, the left of the screen are, are wonderful ways to kind of help do that. Um, you know, some of these can be self-guided or oftentimes we use them in a rehabilitation program. Um, they can be quite fun <laughs> and like motivating, <laughs> like a video game for your vaginal muscles. And um, they can um, kind of help strengthen the whole complex. Ooh, Nash, we, you'd had a question oh, yeah. around, oh, go ahead, Lexi. Six weeks of bleeding is not normal. Two weeks, two weeks. If you're bleeding for longer than two weeks, then we know that you're doing too much most of the time. It could be, it could be retained placenta. However, it's definitely, you're more than likely doing too much because you're birthing this placenta, it's this big, right? And that's a scab mm -hmm. on the uterus. And so if you're doing too much, it's going to pick at the scab. And so that's going to cause that red blood again to come out and come out and come out. And so that's something that I want women to be mindful as well, because I think we, we want to do so much and we think that that bleeding is normal and some providers will say six to eight weeks, but really it can be done in two weeks. Right. So that's right. something I want to say. Yeah. I was going to say we had, we had some questions about like, how do you, if you're like, if you're swollen in your vagina or you had like stitches or tearing, like what are some ways that you can like actually take care of yourself in terms of recovery there? I mean, it's, it's all about the resting, especially in those, those, in those days when you have swelling and, and, and bleeding or the tissues aren't quite um, healed back together, um, doing too much or, and, and, you know, there's always like instances of accidents and injuries. You, there's a fall or like you accidentally hit something or, and kind of ruin a wound, but um, <clears throat> the wound bed, but really protecting those that that what's called the inflammatory phase of wound healing which is that first those first couple of days is the most important in establishing the um the foundation the building blocks that are helping to kind of heal that normal healing process and that when it's disrupted it can lead to chronic um chronic wound healing chronic pain um scar tissue um, beyond what is, is supposed to be there and and pain and dysfunction down the road so really Swelling also in those mu in those muscles and in your joints, it really lends to this your the body's ability to sense um, joint position and movement and um, safety of that area with swelling is is kind of is gone. <laughs> you have the swelling and it's and so your body isn't able to kind of recognize a lot of warning signs. And so that so you know really re trying to kind of help minimize all of those things resting, doing some of those gentle kegels and breaths can be one way to help kind of clear out some of that swelling. Um, but, but resting is really the best place to start. How about you, Lexi? 
I agree with that 100%. Um, have you guys heard? So, you know, rice, right? It used to be rest, ice, oh, yes. elevate for <laughs> an injury. You use brand so, an ankle. Yeah. Yes. So they've changed it. So over the years, so I would never recommend ice. It's called meth now. It's movement, elevation, traction, and heat. And so mm -hmm. I think heat, so sits baths, um, warm baths, Epsom salt baths, things like that to help soak the area and provide heat is going to allow heat heals. Um, and then movement, right? That those gentle movements are going to be necessary because if we brace anything, which you're not going to be bracing your pelvic floor in any way, but if you don't provide motion there, you're not going to bring the blood necessary to heal there and things like that. So you do want to remind, remind yourself that movement is okay. Um, but too much in this point right. of postpartum is not the best for us. Right. And it's totally normal to use your muscles. I mean, you use them when you cough, you use them exactly. when you breathe, you use them when you poop. I mean, it's normal to move them, but yeah, doing too much. And like you were saying, the bleeding that can return and swelling and things like that, pain, those are all warning signs that there's injury. Exactly. So beyond the pelvic floor, the, there is so much going on in the body as well. Um, there's so many factors that affect, that affect the body and the healing. A lot we kind of already touched on, but there's, you know, longer than you realize hours of sitting and nursing and feeding the baby and those, the, your, the muscles on your, your glute muscles, um, they, they don't engage as much because in a sitting position, they're resting, they're lengthened, you know, you're not using them as much. We start tucking our hips more. It can be, you're exhausted. And so your posture, you know, and breastfeeding and you're relaxing on your couch and things can really add up these, these, these repetitive postures and, and movements can really add up down the, the road to pain and dysfunction. You know, you're gazing down at your beautiful baby and your shoulders are rolled forward and your head, it's like tech neck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it really can create a lot of issues. Breastfeeding causes um, those elevated, um, levels of hormones we touched on relax in here and this continues to make the joints a bit more hypermobile the tissues will slow heal more slowly um but also you know with the prolactin we have less estrogen and so then the tissues of the pelvic floor more specifically have less health they're thinner they're drier and um, they aren't as supportive with those thick healthy moisturized vaginal tissues and ligaments really help to support a lot of the structures. And um, in, in these earlier days, um, they can, it can be more in a vulnerable state. Um, the uterus takes six to eight weeks to return to its size. It, it's not uncommon to, for there to be this kind of shrinking over those first couple of, of weeks and months. And breastfeeding can affect the, the rate of weight loss and change in size. Of, of, of your body. So, you know, breastfeeding, maybe there's a big dramatic um, weight change, or maybe it's harder to kind of lose some of the, the, the weight that may have been um, supporting your pregnancy. All of those differences can change the way you feel and the way you move and um, function in the postpartum. And then again, that pelvic floor has gone through so much stretch and trauma in pregnancy and in delivery. So even if you had a cesarean section, your pelvic floor is not spared. Um, you had nine months, you, maybe there was some dilation that affected the pelvic floor. Maybe there was trial of labor. There's so much that can contribute to your pelvic floor changes and in injury. Um, and of course, lack of sleep changes everything in your ability, your body's ability to function and support and coordinate and um, warn you of what's you know, going on. So it's, there's a lot going on in your body. Yeah, and Lexi, I'm sure you like. Do you see from that hunched over breastfeeding mm -hmm. position? Uh, like, what, what? How do you? What do you typically recommend for um, your your new moms? The biggest thing for that is a take home exercise, which nobody ever wants to do. I used to teach it during pregnancy yoga, like three times a week for three years. It was my thing, um, and I forget it sometimes. But it's a really simple exercise, and it's looking down at your thumbs, and you're going to go up and back like a rainbow and you're going to watch that thumb and you're going to bring it back. And that helps create strength in that curvature. Oh, yeah. of that neck. Yeah, just over my computer all day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody, anybody that's leaning forward for whatever reason, but I always say, yes, you're going to adore that sweet little baby. You're going to feed that baby. You're going to, you know, be changing that baby, whatever it is, but you're looking down. So those muscles until they get acclimated or used to that position, which 
is somewhat a natural position, right? If you think about it, we were created to do this. So we were created to feed our babies, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But until they're acclimated to that position, it is a really large transition. And that exercise does really help people. Um, even if you're not able to use your thumb, like if you have your baby there, you can kind of look up and back. So it's a very limited movement or um, a non-existent movement basically in today's world with us so forward facing. Yeah. So. And I'm sure you see so much stiffness in that thoracic spine too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not only your breasts are heavier, it's not just that you're breastfeeding, it's that your, your breasts are heavier and yeah. there, you know, your diaphragm was stuck. There was a baby in it for a long, long time and so much um, is, is vulnerable. So. Mm -hmm. And then returning exercise is tricky. We've been kind of talking about it a lot this whole time. It is, it should be a slow and gradual process. At six weeks, that's when you might be cleared for exercise. I, that really still kind of um, is based on the, the healing, the, um, the normal progression of healing um, in physiology. So at six weeks, you may clear you for everything. And it's really kind of like an eye-opening, like everything? What does that mean? And like, what does that look like and feel like? Um, it's really important though to respect your body and the changes that it's gone through. I, I know, I think one of the, the hardest things, the hardest pill to swallow is that it isn't as easy as we hope it will be to kind of return. It is so easy to get out of shape. I'll just <laughs> recognize that. Getting into shape is the hard part. And I think we, I'm, you know, we are um, amazing going through uh -oh these changes and this this marathon of a feat and um it's kind of heal and allow your body to change slowly um this doesn't mean you can't do exercise that you love but you know especially in physical therapy we work a lot in modifying it so finding a way for you to be able to do that abdominal routine that you used to love in a way that's safe and healthy and at the level that you're at or um finding a way to get you back progressively um I do think, you know, you need to wait much longer than the six weeks to run. Running is a lot harder of an activity than we, we take it for granted, especially if you haven't had injury or pregnancy. You run, you run, you run. But it's, it's one of those exercises, I mean, half of the time you're not even touching the ground and it's one, you know, your balance is compromised and your pelvis is being used in an asymmetrical way. It's not something to go back to quickly. And we can't forget that that fascia is still... So fast to the connective tissue that kind of lines and surrounds our muscles and bones and connects everything um, is weakened and stretched and it's vulnerable for a while. And so kind of going and jarring your body um, sooner than three months is, is, is can lead, set you up for injury. Um, you may want to avoid sit-ups and crunches and traditional ab exercises. Um, in, in those early stages of healing, this kind of goes back to the diastasis that we're talking about. Um, if we're having a vulnerability at those, between those two muscles, then um, things like crunches may increase strain on that area. Um, and of course, we're avoiding sex or vaginal penetration to allow for healing of those tissues. Um, and you do want to try as best as you can, although if there's any moms on this call, it's like a ridiculous thing for me to say, but try and avoid adding weight more than what your baby is. I know the carrier in itself is three times the size of the baby. Mm -hmm. um, and we touched on running. So any thoughts for returning to exercise, Lexi? Same. I'm with you. I yeah. think um, six weeks is a very arbitrary, arbitrary number. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it Broad relates sweeping. to anybody. Yeah. I don't think it's, it's not individualized whatsoever. Um, I think, um, am I allowed to make a recommendation for an Instagram uh, yeah. account? Have at it. There's a chiropractor up in Michigan. She's Mama Core Method on Instagram and Facebook, and she provides a lot of good content regarding um, core exercises and things like that while pregnant and postpartum. So awesome. she's a really great um, I'm gonna check resource. Her out. Yeah, great. But yeah, it's going to look different. I think it's going yeah. to look different for a while. Um, running, I think, is one of the hardest things on the body, regardless. So then postpartum, you add to it. It's just yeah. yeah, it's just one of those things. I'm like, we need to hold off, hold off, hold yes, off. Yes, yeah, I know. It's hard. You want to get out of the house, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, are there, are we, I know we had some questions, like, everyone wants to know, so we're like, okay, if I shouldn't do these things, like, what are some, like, good, safe exercises for me to, for me to do? I always relate back to that mama core method, and then walking. Walking is the best exercise ever, yeah. like, just period, to get outside, to go, you know what I mean, and just, like, get that out of the way. Um 
and that looks different for everybody. It might be a mile, it might be two miles, it might be four miles, you know, whatever, whatever you feel most comfortable doing. And then, um, then kind of start introducing other things dependent on if they've received the proper care. Cause I do love for people to see public floor PT regardless postpartum, just as a checkup. Yeah. I mean, it's so hard to know what your pelvic floor is doing. And even as a pelvic PT, I have no idea what mine is doing. If, unless I'm, you know, focused on what's going on and get a, a thorough assessment. And really I would myself would need to be seeing another pelvic PT. There's only so much that you can, um, understand, you know, on your own, mm -hmm. but it is, you know, it's a really, I, I agree. Walking is wonderful and it can be challenging in so many different ways. And it's a really great way to progress impact. I really think building a foundation of stability in your muscles and kind of rehabilitating the ones that, um, you know, there's always like this, like light, more than likely these ones are stretched, you know, weakened and things like that. But um, it, you, you know, really kind of looking at what is affecting you and working on stabilizing that skeleton and then moving into more impact and adding impact from there can be really way in, uh, the best way to kind of go. Great. And then sex, I see this on the next slide. So this is so scary in the fourth trimester, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they, I mean, you've, there's been injury and you just had a, a child and, um, and then at six weeks, maybe your partner's anxious and um, knocking on <laughs> the door when you get back from the doctor for that clearance. Um, and, but there are many reasons that change, that can change your, your sexual experience in the postpartum period. Um, so kind of want to touch on it and also demystify like sex was, is probably going to be different in the postpartum period and um, that's okay. Um, and I, I don't know that there is a, um, a vagina owner out there that hasn't experienced changes after baby. Um, there are many reasons why it's less comfortable. You have, um, like we touched on, because of breastfeeding, there, the tissues are going to be drier and you're not going to be producing as much of your own natural lubrication and, and dry, like Sahara Desert dry, because that estrogen is low. And just because you're, and, and it is harder to produce lubrication because the glands um, aren't as supported by the estrogen either. I mean, it doesn't mean you're not turned on or it doesn't mean you're not wanting that sexual experience either. Um, we, uh, there's healing and hormones and stuff that are working against you. Um, scar tissue um, in the, the perineal area. So in the perineal area, kind of the external tissues can tear. You can tear into the labia. You can tear into the perineal body. You can have okay. walls. Um, and all of that can then create scar tissue. It might affect the muscle. It might affect the nerve supply. Um, and that is extremely painful um, during intercourse. Um, we talked, so the birth, uh, there can also be like this anxiety associated with it that's just going to kind of compound on that tension and fear and gripping. And it's the cycle of anxiety and pain. Um, and there's many body changes that, are, uh, that occur that can make it less comfortable. You know, if there was any kind of pubic symphysis dysfunction or low back pain in pregnancy, that may not resolve in those first six weeks, that also can make sex painful. So maybe you're not in a position, your back is, is still hurting you in that, that, that position. Um, or pelvic organ prolapse. Um, if some of the, the organs are falling down and, um, and creating pressure in the pelvic, or heaviness in the pelvic area, sex feels different. Um, but you deserve pain-free and pleasurable sex in the postpartum period. Just because these changes can occur does not mean that we can't help you get back to a normal postpartum sex life. Um, lubricant is your friend, always, but especially in the postpartum period. It's never something to shy away from. It can help so much um, with the experience. Um, the diaphragmatic breathing can be helpful in kind of reducing some of that, that fear or tension. Um, Kegels are one thing that people kind of recommend for pelvic floor fitness and health. It's not always the best way to go. Kegels can actually increase your pain if you're having pain in the pelvic floor related to muscles. Um, but go slow and communicate. It's probably going to be different and weird and painful maybe a little bit in the first couple of times you have intercourse. And so that's why the communicating is so important in the postpartum period. And of course, never force it. What are your experiences with intercourse and back pain and pelvic pubic pain and all of that? 
Lexi? I have noticed that a lot of that can come from um, prolapse more than anything. Yeah. Prolapse or the scar tissue, right? Scar tissue is mm -hmm. just such a beast when it comes yeah. to um, feeling good, feeling normal, you know? Um, <laughs> but a lot of times just helping kind of um, adjusting the pelvis and allowing those organs to kind of lift up too helps alleviate a lot of that. Um, but in that moment, that's when I refer to pelvic PT or some kind of wound care. Cause it's, yeah. it's at that point, I'm like pain, it, sex should not be painful. Sex should not it be painful. Will, it will be in that first couple of times. I, I shouldn't say it, it will be, I, it'll be different, right? It doesn't have right. to be painful, especially if you were doing the things to take care of your body, but it can be if, if those things weren't addressed to begin yeah. with. And so, yeah. And we can help with that scar tissue. It is something we treat all the time. And decades later, we can improve that tissue, that flexibility and and um, mobility of the tissue. So yeah, I know I actually had a that. question about that, which was like, are there any tips to kind of work out that scar tissue just like on your own that people could do at home? You know, there are some really good um, resources. If looking up like perineal massage, the, we, we, all, we all recommend perineal, perineal massage in, the, um, in pregnancy to kind of help prepare for, for labor and delivery, maybe getting those tissues used to stretching, improve flexibility, um, also kind of like help you with your mindset in, during that stretch. But the perineal massage can also be really helpful in the postpartum period um, to kind of help soften and work those tissues. So kind of looking at something like perineal massage and kind of seeing what those, um, what those recommendations are can be a really good place to start. But more individual um, help, is it's hard to kind of be specific. Um, scar tissue is a really helpful thing. It helps to heal and protect and decrease infection, mm -hmm. but it also, it's just, it's just not normal um, connective tissue that it's, it's not as strong. It's not oriented in the right way. Um, and if, if the scar tissue remains, it can grow over, it can trap nerves, it can create blood flow issues. And we really just want to help work it back to its normal connective tissue state. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. <laughs> so DRA, it's always, it's always on everyone's mind that diastasis rectus abdominis, the muscle separation, we'll kind of touch on it real quick a bit more here. Um, but it's that abnormal separation of that linea alba. So that is the thick connective tissue between the two rectus abdominis muscle belly. So your six pack muscle. It is made up of all of the fascia from the abdominal muscle layers. There's several layers of abdominal muscles and together they form this, this wonderful um, supportive structured sheath of strength in your core. Um, they, you know, they go in and connect with the back muscles and the spine and it's really a helpful structure. But in pregnancy, when those stretch and thin out, then they can become less supportive. And um, oftentimes you'll see like a doming when you um, do like a crunch or um, do something that kind of strains those tissues and um, the, your abdominal organs can kind of push out and create that doming that we'll see. Um, again, it does occur, it's normal in pregnancy in that third trimester, but it should go back to normal. Kind of by the medical definition, we define it as a greater than two centimeters between the two rectus abdominis muscle bellies. But I, it's so much more than that. We also look at width. We look at the depth of, of tissue, um, vulnerability, um, and your body's ability to kind of compensate for some of those um, uh, weaknesses. Um, things like, um, you know, crunching, getting out of bed, also like pulling up tight yoga pants or pulling off your sports bra or like one of those, those like sneaky like ways to really strain your abdominals. But I feel like I did that with my sports bra the other day. It really is one of those, we want to protect those muscles and um, restore the integrity of the um, connective tissue in the abdomen um, in the postpartum period. And is there people, I know like, I feel like all of my postpartum friends are like, they're, I'm not a physical therapist, but they're like, Allison, can you check? Like, how do I know if I have it? Is there like a quick check people can do just at home? Yeah. Yeah. Any, any thoughts, Dr. Lexi? I... I feel like it's hard because not everybody understands what they're touching, right? <laughs> but but if you lay on your back 
knees are bent, right? You kind of do a little crunch up. You can kind of feel down two spots below, or like above the belly button and then one spot below the belly button and see if there's any kind of, um, I don't know, what do you say, like dips or like- Softness. softness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and really, yeah, exactly. It's a nice quick screen. You lie on your back, knees bent, and just kind of lift your head and shoulders up off the, the floor. And then just feel, a diastasis can occur anywhere from um, the bottom of your rib cage to your pubic bone because the, that linea alba is the, goes the whole way. Mm -hmm. And so most commonly, of course, it occurs within four centimeters of the belly button, but it can occur anywhere along there. And kind of depending on a, a certain person's risks, um, it could be, you know, at the above the belly button. It can also sometimes be combined with um, uh, like an umbilica, umbilical hernia um, or things like that. And so, mm -hmm. well, you know, as, as, a, as a screen, of course, it's, it's not to diagnose, but it's to kind of go, hmm, maybe something's going on here and I could go get this looked at further. But if you do do that crunch and there is either, like, a, like you said, like a dip or a softness and you're feeling down the center of your abdomen where in that picture there, um, or if you see like a doming or like this little like growth out of it, you know, that like when you do that crunch, there's a little bit of a pooch that kind of pops up right there. Those might be signs that you may, maybe something is going on. It doesn't always mean that there is a diastasis. There's all sorts of other, um, maybe it could, it could be a hernia. It could just be um, like in skin and um, tissue from, from the pregnancy. Um, but it's always, it's a one way to kind of like get the, hmm, maybe I need to go That's kind it. of get those looked at. A yeah. gut check, both literally. A gut check, but literally. That's it. exactly. <laughs> and for one that hasn't had children, anybody can have it because our car, our oh, yeah. cores are so weak from sedentary lifestyles. So that is something anybody, to, anybody sure. can check that. You can Especially see it in men. children. Men yeah, in men. Yeah, children exactly. Too. Yeah. And so healing really the whole, I mean, what we try and do is restore the integrity of those tissues. Um, of course, we're working on coordinating and strengthening the muscles. Our deepest muscle, the transversus abdominis muscle, so that TRA noted on the slide is the transversus abdominis. It's the innermost abdominal muscle. And it really is like this like inner girdle, that girdle muscle that kind of helps with kind of um, stabilizing the spine. It compensates a lot for integrity um, that may be missing from the, uh, the from the separated um, rectus abdominis muscles. We use rehabilitation of that muscle to kind of help bolster the strength of that connective tissue. And then also, you still want to be able to use those rectus abdominis muscles. They're still, they're still very functional and you need them um, for every movement in, in, in your life. <laughs> so it's important to kind of help heal those as well in a nice safe way. You will see normal in, in improvement in the first weeks of pregnancy, um, and which will slow down and, and be part of a frustrating part of rehabilitation. But it is important to kind of to go through it in a responsible way that isn't increasing a strain on those tissues. Um, one movements that really strain it, and the reason why they're straining it is because they really increase the intra-abdominal pressure are things like crunches, sit-ups, Russian twists. Um, always look for dummy. And, but these are just general guidelines. It's different for everybody. And um, some people can do crunches with a, a abdominal separation, no problem. It's really just it depends on the individual, the stage they're in, and um, what's going on with them. Awesome. So when to see a pelvic physical therapist, you know, kind of all of this, it's like, well, what is normal? What is not? I mean, you get so much information for sure. You'll know you have, you know, s symptoms that might indicate that you have pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, these are symptoms that you want to look for. They're not normal. It's not just because you had a baby. It's not something you have to yes. put up with, yes. um, but pelvic heaviness. Um, bulging, maybe you see tissues hanging out of the, the vaginal opening or um, it feels like something's in there. A lot of times it can be described like there's like a full tampon in your vagina. It just feels heavy and falling. Um, it might indicate that there's prolapse or leaking of urine or potentially poop can leak. Um, maybe you can't get yourself all the way clean and you're just wiping and wiping and wiping. It's not necessarily like loss of full stool 
but um, you're having trouble getting clean or there's staining of the underwear, those might indicate that pelvic floor dysfunction is present. Um, feeling like you have to pee frequently, like every time you put your key in the door, you're running water and you're running to the bathroom to make it on time. That might be a sign that pelvic floor muscle is, is injured. Of course, we talked about painful sex. It's not, it's not normal to have pain with sex. And then pelvic pain of any kind. So maybe the lower abdomen, the pubic bone, inner thighs, um, all of that might indicate that the pelvic floor is, is vulnerable. Because there's so much that occurs. You know, things like childbirth, trauma, constipation, hormone changes, stress, all of this that we have in the column here, that can contribute to pelvic floor dysfunction. And, and something like a, a big life-changing um, event like pregnancy and delivery can really leave um, vagina owners vulnerable to pelvic floor dysfunction. So any thoughts on that? What do you, when, when are your kind of like go-tos for, for referral? Usually heaviness or prolapse. Um, yeah. I think that's usually the first sign, right? Yeah. Um, I think from there, then it's, it's urgency, urination urgency, and then infrequency is another I think, one. Yeah. I think we all kind of like expect to have incontinence and like we're okay with it, even though it's not normal, but it's those signs that like, oh, I, it's something coming out and, and things that really can um, be scary in the postpartum period, but there is, we're all, we're here to help. Um, like you mentioned, the, the pelvic bone alignment is super important for the integrity of those muscles. If it's all, we all, it all works together. And so when there's something, when there's a support structure that's off, um, we need um, to, to, to work, look at the whole body, head to toe, it's all important, so. Yeah, All so right, that's well, it. We, yeah, I know we have a couple minutes left for questions. Um, Lexi, anything you want to touch on just in terms of when, you know, when it makes sense to um, to come to our wellness community or, or how yeah. you will work with patients? Oh, man, I see. I always say preconception. Preconception is the best time for care. <laughs> um, obviously, I will see anybody at any point in pregnancy, postpartum. It does not matter when. Um, it also does not matter their ability to pay. Um, I serve single income and working families. And so I work with every kind of income at the space. Um, so unfortunately right now my schedule is so busy. So that's the only tough part is, is actually yeah. getting scheduled. Right. But, um, I try and work at that wait list every, every day. So hopefully in time, everybody can be seen, but <laughs> I always say at any point, because chiropractic is about maximizing genetic potential. And so I see newborn all the way through grandparent, but pregnancy is my special focus. Okay. And um, it's a community, a wonderful community. So even, you know, it's, it's one of those, it's a place to be and belong and talk and figure out what, what's needed. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful place, even if you're not knowing what or when, like I said, it's a community to be um, known. So. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, well, one of the questions we had in advance was just like, I think this probably touches on a lot of the things that we've we've um, gone over a little bit, but just like, how do you get back to your normal self? And I know we talk a lot at Origin about, it's not about like getting back or bouncing back, but it's really about like, how are you moving forward with these new identities? But are there, are there any things that you all think about just like, um, whether that's community-based or exercise-based that help people sort of feel like themselves again, or feel like things are quote unquote back to normal? Oh, that's a great question. That's hard. It really, it really does depend on the individual. What I like doing myself, I like to really like interview the person, you know, trying to kind of figure out what, what, what is it that is not making you feel like yourself? Like what, what brings you joy and how is there a functional component to that? How can we get back to um, that, that movement or that joy or whatever it may be? A lot of times, Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with physical therapy, but being able to know that there are and provide resources out there for whatever somebody needs to get back to feeling like themselves and bring, finding that joy again, I think is important. And just really talking and knowing that you're not alone in, in the healing and the experiences that you're having and that there's, there's people out there to help. So any thoughts? Do you like I think for us specifically in our practice, a lot of people are always like, oh, you know, prenatal practices and that's it, right? So for us, mm -hmm. we have a close to 100% retention rate simply because women still continue to come postpartum. And I think that creates some normalcy within their mm -hmm. lives. They're getting out once a week, they're going somewhere, 
they get to connect with me, but then they also get to connect with any other moms that are there, anybody else that's breastfeeding their baby in the waiting area or, you know, play with their toddlers in the back or whatever it may be. And so I think sometimes creating that community within your, your wellness care is super important to help get you out there and to help kind of understand maybe it is something that you may not know that you need, but at least communicating with somebody else or connecting with somebody else or just getting out the door sometimes can be really beneficial. Yeah. 100%. Yep. Um, well, if there's any other questions, feel free to throw us in the chat. Um, but we have another, we have one coming in. Okay. Um, this is about before postpartum. Is there a way to prepare your pelvic floor before birth to better stabilize for the, for the aftermath? <laughs> That's yes. so, that's, that's so perfectly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I always think, you know, your pelvic floor wellness is, is, is important um, for so many reasons. We, you know, we know that a strong, healthy pelvic floor muscle will do, will perform better in something like a birth and heal faster in the recovery. But what, what that means, like what is a healthy and strong pelvic floor is so different for individuals. Kind of, I think like the advice we most often hear is to do your Kegels, but that isn't necessarily what is best for an individual's pelvic floor. And it always depends. A muscle that is long and weak needs to be strengthened with something mm -hmm. like Kegels or core strengthening exercises that could um, help the pelvic floor. But a muscle that has tension and pain, maybe poor blood flow or poor coordination doesn't need to be strengthened necessarily right away. Those are muscles that we work on lengthening and releasing to kind of help to restore potential. Maybe a muscle was so tight, it just didn't know how to contract. And after we re um, lengthen that, teach that muscle to lengthen again, it has fine strength. Um, or maybe it was weak and tight and we needed to, we need to strengthen it after. Um, in pregnancy, I think it's important to have strong muscles, whatever that means, but then also prepare those muscles to learn how to release and open for delivery. Um, we don't want to teach them to be so strong and close that, you know, it, it disrupts the labor process. We also want to balance strength with length and coordination. It's tricky. There's a lot involved, but <laughs> mm -hmm. what else do you say for fitness in the pelvic floor and to pre for pregnancy i think nutrition 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 mm -hmm. nutrition because we want to be able to feed those areas um whether it's collagen vitamin c that creates collagen a and zinc to help you know restore those tissue areas the omegas um just good nutrition in general we mm -hmm. know sugar increases scar tissue so if there was a trauma there prior, whether it was a prior birth, whether it was a sexual trauma, whether it was, you know, whatever it may be, yeah. sugar always increases that. So I think people want a quick fix for everything, right? But mm -hmm. it, everything takes time and effort. And this is about an investment in your health, right? Mm -hmm. And this allows like this experience coming up, this birth experience literally lays the foundation for the rest of your child's life. And so it's so important to take it seriously pre- conception onwards right and so right. i think i think it's nutrition that really plays a big part in it that's awesome yeah well i think that might be it for q a um if just maybe um lexi and ashley do you want to give uh everyone just a sense of how they could find you or how they could um you know book a visit with you if they wanted to yeah go for it lexi uh several ways uh we have an online web uh online scheduling site which is our wellness community .com. um you can also access that through our actual website which is owcdallas.com and then we have obviously our instagram our wellness community dallas uh, not dot com not dot com our uh, owc dallas i think is the instagram handle yeah and at origin you can um of course use our online booking tool at um, theoriginway.com and our Instagram is the same, The Origin Way. And um, there's wonderful that get in contact with us. There's online scheduling tools. You can call us and talk to a person to kind of, you know, ask your questions. Um, but we're we're here and available. We see patients in California, um, in person and virtually. And then in Texas and New York, we're treating patients virtually, which is just a wonderful way to bring care to wherever you are, um, even if it's at like the Y or the your couch or whatever it may be, <laughs> we want to get 
access however um, you're, you're needing it while you're breastfeeding, whatever it may be. Um, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank everyone so much. This is so helpful. I learned a lot. Um, uh, thank you guys again. Yes, thank you. Thanks, right, Lexi. Good to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.